And this is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. A Winnipeg man is begging for information about his son's hit and run. Cody Joss died after he was hit by a vehicle on Inkster Boulevard in McGregor Street in 2014. CBC's Joanne Roberts has the story. I'm here to plead to the person or persons that may have info on what happened to my son that fatal night. Eight years ago, Kevin Joss's son Cody was hit by a vehicle. It happened in December of 2014 as he was walking on McGregor Street and Inkster Boulevard in the evening. The 21-year-old later died from his injuries. We need to know what went on um, and we need to start healing. Even though eight years have passed, Joss is still begging people who may know anything to come forward and speak with police. It's not too late. Any little bit of information that you have um, can really help us out. By the time police arrived, the vehicle involved was gone. Officers are still working to solve the case, but say they can't investigate further without the public's help. We have uh, enough other evidence surrounding this that we are looking for that person who may just have a close, a close link or nexus that can, that can make this uh, case complete. Jaw says this year has hit him particularly hard. There were 19 serious collisions involving pedestrians this year. 12 were fatal. Joss says every time he hears of another, it impacts his entire family. It sends such a ripple effect through to this family and to others. Police say many of the serious collisions they investigated involved dangerous driving. Joss wants people to remember this before they get behind the wheel. I want you to take a look at your loved ones and realize that, you know, it can happen to you. Everybody says nothing, you know, it, it, it wouldn't happen to me. It, I stand before you and tell you it happened to us. Investigators say no one has come forward with information about Cody's death. Joanne Roberts, CBC News, Winnipeg. Members of City Council are gearing up for a new year and already Winnipeg is facing challenges on multiple fronts. CBC's Cameron McLean sat down with Mayor Scott Gillingham to get a sense of what's ahead. He says one of his top priorities will be to begin tackling the crisis facing Winnipeg's downtown. Business needs to be at the table. Uh, other nonprofits need to be at the table so that together we're all coming together in establishing one coordinated plan that, uh, that makes our downtown safer and healthier and ultimately gets the people who are struggling the, the services they need to, to change their lives. Now coming up later in our program tonight, Cameron McLean's full year-end interview with Mayor Scott Gillingham. We will bring that to you in about 15 minutes from now. Another progressive conservative MLA in Manitoba is calling it a career. Deputy Premier Cliff Cullen is not running for another term in the Manitoba legislature. The Spruce Woods MLA was first elected in 2004. He is among seven PC MLAs to announce their departures from politics this year. Scott Fielding resigned in March, while Eileen Clark, Dennis Smook, Ralph Eichler, Ian Wishart and Blaine Peterson have all announced they won't run in the next provincial election. That election is slated for the fall of 2023. The city of Brandon hopes to breathe new life into its downtown core. A task force set up last year recently released its recommendations for getting people back to the city's downtown. Among those suggestions, creating an Indigenous wellness centre and mobile outreach unit to help people in need. Other recommendations include setting up transitional housing and creating incentives to build new housing. Respiratory viruses are continuing to cause high numbers of critically ill pediatric patients in our province. There were 21 pediatric intensive care patients at the Health Sciences Centre as of this morning. The normal baseline capacity for that unit is nine. The majority of those patients were infants or toddlers experiencing severe respiratory symptoms. Well, 99 new Canadians are being appointed to the Order of Canada, one of our country's highest honours. Among those inductees, four Manitobans. 
Winnipeg's Steve Bell is being recognized for his contributions to Canadian music and his advocacy of social and community causes. Journalist Bernard Joseph Bockel is recognized for showcasing the history of Franco-Manitobans. The Honourable Maria Emma Chaput for her work on official languages and as a senator, and Patricia N Margaret Naguance as a teacher, author and publisher, contributing to the vitality of Indigenous languages. A local nonprofit organization is helping newcomer families get more familiar with Winnipeg. They find getting active with sports helps them get active in the community as well, even if they don't speak the same language. The CBC's Janelle Henry reports. Okay, ready? Quick foot first. When language is a barrier, sport becomes a common language. The Winnipeg Newcomer Sport Academy helps young people learn about Canada through sport and recreation. Judo is a universal language. You don't need to speak too much. It's just the body language. Like you do it and you, you, like you learn like just trying and falling and throwing. I'm here at the University of Winnipeg's Rec Puck Centre for the Community Sport Festival. There are over 120 kids here playing sports in different stations like this spread out all throughout the gym. So we have a lot of different uh, people coming from different communities. So we have people from the Ukraine, we have people from Congo, Afghanistan, Syria, some Canadian-born kids. Morgan Reitberger says applications are way up this year for people wanting to participate. She says some of the kids at the camp moved here within the last six months. Orisia Patrician is a teacher at Sisler High School. She's here on winter break to support Ukrainian newcomers who recently fled the war. And I translated in Ukrainian Sportivny Festival pre Universiteti Winnipegu. And I wrote Laskawa Zaprosimo uh, because I thought if Ukrainians will come, they will be able to see and they will be able to see that they are welcome. Here, Ukrainians are connecting with each other and the wider Winnipeg community. What I see, so many are volunteers or parents who arrived, they were able to meet each other, to connect with each other, to share uh, what they are looking for, their stories. Besides yeah, judo, yeah, people could try out dance, soccer and indigenous games, led by Sunny Albert from Norway House. We have a few games that I have uh, in store, so it co goes across uh, all uh, Turtle Island. Um, I just explained for the volunteers, we did a uh, Coast Salish game where they have, um, um, it's called Bear, uh, Frog and Mosquito. So the bear eats the frog, uh, the frog eats the mosquito, and then the mosquito eats the frog. So it's sort of like a uh, tag with uh, rock, paper, scissors on it. He hopes these traditional games help newcomers gain a deeper understanding of Indigenous people and their cultures. Janelle Henry, CBC hello. News, Winnipeg. Hello, hello. So All right, meteorologist John Sauter is here at the forecast now, and we've seen a little bit of light snow here in the city today. Yeah, we have. You know, it's been like that lately where... Yeah. Frequently, you have to go and get about this much snow <laughs> off the front step and the yeah. sidewalk. It's just, you know, it's a lot of shoveling, but just, you know, not very heavy duty mm. lifting or anything like that. Should see some clearing tonight. I want to show you the current temperature first. We're at minus 14. Temperature today actually started this morning at around minus 11. Uh, wind chill, uh, not quite in the frostbite range. I think you get head outside tonight without too much worry of getting frostbite. Our winds are going to start to settle down now northwest. Uh, 19 and they've been as high as about 25 through the day today. So this minus 14 is actually pretty close to seasonal and the snow that's falling now will end as this well, pesky system just continues to move off to the north and east. You know, on the satellite and radar, you do see some clearing. That's the satellite. The satellite shows us the cloud cover over the last three hours where it has been. So you can see the clouds just trying to clear out of Winnipeg, but this is infrared satellites so it senses heat coming from the ground and with snow on the ground it can be kind of fooled so there is some clouds still west of Winnipeg. On radar if you look carefully enough in the beginning of the loop you see just a little bit of light snow just to the north of Winnipeg heading through the Interlake area and that's what we're seeing in Winnipeg right now not even really showing up on the radar it is so light. Uh, we have one advisory left in our forecast region on the Ontario side of the border. A freezing drizzle advisory still in effect. 
should end sometime later tonight, but we've got some icy highways on that Ontario side of the border. So when you look at future casts, it's kind of like a future satellite image. Not really possible, but what it does is it uses numerical prediction to kind of figure out where the clouds are going to be and where they are going to clear. And this is why I'm calling for mainly sunny skies by tomorrow morning. So partly cloudy or clearing overnight and a nice sunny sky through the Red River Valley in the morning on into the afternoon. We'll even see some clearing farther out to the east in Kenora. But this is right around sunset and that's when the clouds start to thicken up again from the west and we have cloud cover heading into the weekend. Saturday, last day of 2022, should be up around minus 7. And then the good news is if you're going outside for New Year's Eve for a bonfire or fireworks or just some family time, it looks like temperatures will stay fairly pleasant through the evening hours and not a whole lot of wind. And then as we get into Sunday, first day of 2023, we are still under some cloud cover. So minus 21 tonight. Tomorrow is the brighter day, the brightest day we've seen in a while. We start with a cool minus 20, end up at minus 14 with a south wind at only 10 kilometers per hour. Pretty comfortable day to be outside. In the north, some more snow tonight. A little bit more tomorrow for Thompson, Lynn Lake, periods of light snow in the east and cooler in the west, minus 18s with some clearing around the Paw and Flin Flon. Much brighter conditions here across southern Manitoba. A sun cloud mix leaning toward the sunshine in most areas right across the south, minus 12 to minus 14 generally, a little cooler in Barron's River and a little bit milder out in northwestern Ontario after some morning flurries, may even see some sunny patches around Kenora and Fort Francis in the afternoon. Your seven-day forecast still to come. The weather update is brought to you by Home Equip, your trusted local source for Pride Mobility scooters. From sales to rental and repair, our team is here to serve you. Singer-songwriter Ian Tyson has died. He penned some of the most enduring Canadian melodies as part of the duo Ian and Sylvia. Four strong winds that blow the pair moved to New York and signed a record deal in the early 60s. Ian Tyson's first composition and what became the pair's signature, Four Strong Winds, was on their second album. More hits followed, including, including Summer Wages and Someday Soon, many covered by other artists. The end of the folk revival saw Ian and Sylvia break up both professionally and personally. Ian took up ranching before launching a solo country career. Ian Tyson was 89 years old. And the soccer world is mourning the passing of Brazilian legend Pele. The superstar athlete was the only player in history to win the World Cup three times. For more than 60 years, his name was synonymous with the sport. In recent months, he had been admitted to hospital in Sao Paulo battling colon cancer and a respiratory infection. Pele was 82 years old. Well, game development, it's no longer a male domain. So what does it take for women to win in this tough industry? Here are the stories of two game designers who are opening the doors for other women. So you can always tell, you can always tell when a game is made by a woman, you know? It's just, the themes are just different. The themes are just completely different. It's like, oh, I see, you know, this is, this is a character symbolizing, you know, like, bad relationships from a woman's perspective. It's like, ah, now we're going to learn something that's not just how to shoot a demon in the face. <laughs> Flighty Felon Games is a game design company based in Winnipeg, owned by Rebecca and her husband, Zachary. Three out of five of their staff are women. I could think of one story where I would try to communicate emails, just anything with a male coworker in a different department, but then we'd get ignored just absolute silence and unfortunately the one way I could get around that is talking to my um my other male co-workers in my I mean my department and then letting them message this person in the other department and he was he would respond to them immediately. Statistically speaking her experience was not a one-off. While women have been working to break into the game design and other tech industries not all of them have felt welcomed. Studies done by the Government of Canada on Women in Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics, or STEM, 
show that 46% of women say they have been held back by gender stereotyping and microaggressions. For decades, women have been fighting to break free of the traditional jobs available to them. They have also had to fight for leadership roles within their professions. The gaming industry is no exception. But with the influx of women joining the tech field and with more funding to support a diverse workforce, we are seeing a change. Well, we use the Canadian Media Fund and they actually have points for parity. So if you're if over 50% of the key um, individuals in your studio are women, you get an extra two points on their grading rubric, which out of 100, is, it's not huge, but it's, it's definitely something. So while women may have started in more traditional jobs like this, they are paving the way for more opportunities. Be an advocate for yourself. Um, there are so many roles that I've passed over for myself where I would have probably been qualified. So just, just apply for that role. Um, you definitely do not need a 100% match with the job description. Uh, you may have skills that definitely work alongside the role. and. To emphasize them would be better than passing over them and skipping applying. If anyone's listening uh, and you're a girl and you want to get into the industry, don't don't be afraid because there are other girls in the industry and like just go go be friends with them when you get in and then you'll be okay. Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillingham took office just a couple of months ago and it's been a rocky couple of months with a homicide at the downtown library, the arrest of an accused serial killer, and other issues facing our city. Our year-end interview with the mayor, up next. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. Well, it has been less than two months since Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillingham took office. Since then, the city he leads has faced a number of crises. These include an alleged serial killer accused in the deaths of four women, a homicide in the downtown library, and a woman who froze to death in a bus shelter. In a year-end interview, CBC City Hall reporter Cameron McLean spoke with the mayor about how he plans to tackle these issues in the coming year. Well, Mayor Scott Gillingham, thank you so much for making the time to speak with us today. These have been some of the darkest months in Winnipeg's history. What do you see as your role as the mayor to get us through these crises that we're facing right now? You're right, Cameron. They've been really difficult weeks. Part of my role is to try to make sure that we have a steady path together forward, but we need to do it together. And I think first and foremost, we need to acknowledge that right now there are families that are grieving, the, the families of the Indigenous women who were, who were murdered, uh, the families of, uh, you know, the gentleman who passed away, was killed in our library, the individuals, the families that, that are affected by people living on the street right now. So these are difficult days, but my job is to make sure we come together, uh, provide the supports that families need, and, <clears throat> and um, make sure that uh, our, our city knows that the brighter days are ahead. Pulling back from the immediate issues facing the city right now, the, I'm aware of the context of when you first came into office as a councillor eight years ago. It was just after this, the discovery of Tina Fontaine's body in the Red River. Some people might say, you know, look, he's been in office in some way or shape or form for eight years now. And what has changed in that time? What, what should people, or why should people have confidence in you personally mm -hmm. to lead on this issue? I think several things have changed in the eight years I've been here, and I want to give credit to former Mayor Brian Bowman for leading a lot of those changes, and certainly I, I can only imagine the pain, and I, I don't know the pain, the, uh, you know, I want to be honest, I can only imagine the pain of what the family members are going through. And I think what's important to know and to realize again is that I am working with Indigenous leaders specifically on a feasibility study to uh, recover remains of loved ones. That's very important. Do you think a search will happen in some way, shape or form? I know the scope, the timing of it mm -hmm. is all to be determined, but do you think ultimately there will be a search? 
What I know is there'll be a, we're, we're taking steps for a feasibility study to determine this, the search. And the feasibility study will uh, involve professionals and experts who can analyze whether or not uh, or, you know, a search can happen or, and what to, uh, the scale and the scope of the search. That's beyond my expertise, but I'm committed to making sure that that feasibility study happens. Moving on to another heavy topic, but somewhat related. Uh, people have been seeing and hearing about incidents of violence in our downtown and core area for a long time now. Some people are they're, they're losing faith in downtown. Uh, what can you do to try to restore people's faith and hope in the downtown of Winnipeg? Uh, implement what I committed to implement in my platform, and we've already started that. I, what I'm really working towards is kind of one coordinated, comprehensive plan that has, as, as partners within the plan, uh, the province of Manitoba and its departments and, and funding sources, agencies such as our silo missions and Main Street projects and Union Gospel missions and Lighthouse missions and St. Boniface Street Links and one just city and all the myriad of others who are doing such great work. Business needs to be at the table. Uh, other nonprofits need to be at the table so that together we're all coming together in establishing one coordinated plan that, uh, that makes our downtown safer and healthier and ultimately gets the people who are struggling the, the services they need to, to change their lives. What's the timeline for that? That's a big, the, the, you're, it, you're talking about bringing in multiple pieces yes. together. Uh, how, how do you do that and when could we expect to see that? You're right, this is Herculean. I don't think it's ever been a, a, attempted in our city, but we just cannot continue to do things the same way. We can't continue to just kind of, you know, kind of sprinkle a little bit of funding here and hope it gets better over there. We, we've got to tackle this, uh, you know, head on. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Meteorologist John Sauter has his seven-day forecast. When we come back, we'll also have your daily lift. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. Stay with us. Now it's getting close. Here is your New Year's Eve forecast for you. The New Year's weekend, I guess you could call it. Now the high on Saturday under a cloudy sky is minus seven. Through the evening, temperatures kind of hold. So very comfortable to be outside. And the New Year's Day still cloudy with a high of minus nine. Tomorrow is the cooler day, but it is the brighter day. And then that cloudy weekend as we welcome in 2023. Pretty seasonal temperatures Next week, normal high is minus 13, and we may see a little bit more light snow on Tuesday. Riley, you know that old song, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas? <laughs> that I do. <laughs> well, uh, guess what they got at a zoo in Virginia? A hippopotamus. Yeah. The Richmond Zoo welcomed in a rare baby pygmy hippo earlier this month. That hippo's birth is our daily lift. She is just the second member of the endangered species to be born in that state. After a week, she weighed a little over 24 pounds. Now that is a far cry <laughs> from the possible 600 pounds she could weigh when she's an adult. This little girl is yet to be named and is staying with her mother out of the public view for now. Soon though, they will be moved into an indoor pool area where zoo visitors will be able to see the babies start to learn how to swim and act like a hippo. You know, it's sort of cute. It's very cute. Yeah, very it's cute. very cute. Yeah, they very small. They grow very quickly <laughs> and, and they grow very large. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Thank you for being with us tonight. We'll see you tomorrow at six. Have a wonderful evening. Happy New Year.